So, it's been five months since the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Broward County, Florida, on Valentine's Day in 2018. Since then, a lot of things have changed, both within the local community and within the nation as a whole. And obviously, a lot of lives have been affected. Again, not just those directly involved in the tragedy, but other people across the community and even across the nation, all of the United States, we have felt the impact of this event. Particularly, we've seen a lot of legal changes regarding firearms, as protests and demonstrations against guns continue to occur with great fervor across our nation. Thus, today, I want to discuss how the media potentially affects policy, and legislators and the policies that they make through what's called the CNN effect, or what I believe in this instance could be more aptly called the Parkland effect. But before we get into the data and we look at what has happened over the last five months, let's quickly go over some of the demonstrations themselves before we get into the policy, the protests, and the general events that have occurred since the appalling shooting this February. Most obviously, of course, there was the March for Our Lives, which raised millions of dollars, millions actually more than needed to fund the event. And unfortunately, friends, I cannot tell you who all donated those millions upon millions. Because while we do know about some donators, the March for Our Lives is a 501c3 nonprofit, which allows them to not be forced to disclose their donors. In other words, they're taking in a ton of money, probably more than we even know, and they have no requirement to report to the public who exactly, in total, is providing that money. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, nor am I actually making any kind of judgment statement upon it. Just letting you know if you were interested in who the March for Our Lives donors were. Then there were the many high media attention school walkouts that occurred across the country, but particularly across Florida, which despite gaining, again, national attention, well, to a lesser extent, did the simultaneous lootings and destruction of local businesses that was engaged in by said students who had left their schools. Yeah, that kind of shit, that received considerably less media attention than the walkouts themselves. Again, no judgments, just plain recap here. It is a fact that businesses were looted and destroyed during the walkouts. And speaking of businesses, we saw a series of die-ins, a die-in being a form of protest wherein protesters lie down on the floor representing dead bodies across different Publix grocery stores in May, which were conducted in response to the Publix Corporation's support of gubernatorial candidate Adam Putnam for having also received NRA funding. After the Publix demonstrations, for which Publix, by the way, pulled their support for Adam Putnam, now graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the infamous, or famous, however you want to describe him, David Hogg, similarly suggested a die-in outside of Trump Tower, mere weeks after a man tragically died in a fire in Trump Tower. I suppose somewhere, someone down the line realized that just what bad taste such a thing would be in, and as such, that particular die-in didn't happen. However, that didn't stop the wave of other die-ins to protest Trump and to protest the NRA and to call for greater gun control across the nation, with similar events having been held at the Chicago Trump Tower and at President Trump's Florida home, Mar-a-Lago. I suppose in the same vein as the concept of the die-in at the Trump Tower in New York being cancelled, the organizers of a similar anti-gun die-in at Disney World, which had been planned because the Disney Corporation similarly had given money towards Putnam's campaign, was also recently cancelled, but only at the last minute. Now, the organizers seem to claim that they cancelled the event to avoid disturbing the public, but let me just say that I know a thing or two about Disney, and uh, I, I don't think that protest would have been allowed to occur for about more than five seconds without every single protester being kicked out on their arse permanently from the park. And if you're interested in learning more about Disney, you could go and just delve deep into this entire side of YouTube I didn't know existed that was just about theme parks, particularly about Disney. Of course, I recommend Defunct Land and Bright Side Films, but uh, <laughs> I digress. The point is, Disney really, really does not joke around about maintaining their image as being the happiest place on Earth. So if you want to sully the happiest place on Earth by pretending to represent a dead body, I'm just gonna say, I think the mouse is gonna kick your ass out. Everyone, please stop fighting. I, Walt Disney, created you to spread happiness, not bigotry. He so did. Just look at me, Uncle Remus. You tell's a mouse of Disney. Anyway, moving on. David Hogg also recently spoke about gun control at the 2018 National Education Association Representative Assembly 
just a few days ago earlier in July in front of over 6,000 delegates. They are the policy-making body of the National Education Association. And just a week or so ago, six to 8,000 of them were sitting with ears open to hear what David Hogg had to say. Pull up David Hogg's Twitter. David Hogg just tweeted out, we need less politicians that are career politicians and more people that come from the private sector. Explosion. Wow, David Hogg, his name is Donald Trump. Negative IQ. I mean, I, seriously, you know what? I guess I just, we have. And if you're wondering how this event has continued to affect the local area beyond some of this national level stuff I'm talking about, two cities in Broward County requested that no fireworks be launched on the 4th of July this year out of concern for people with PTSD following the shooting. Finally, the ongoing Road to Change tour, which is funded entirely pretty much by the March for Our Lives, all those millions of dollars that they raised and don't have to disclose from their anonymous donors, is currently in full and active swing. It is a summer-long bus tour of students and activists, which is set to visit 20 states with 50 stops to campaign for stricter gun control legislation. In other words, if you thought the explosion of Activision, demonstrations, and protests involving Parkland and in response to Parkland has in any way subsided, let me tell you, it sure as hell hasn't. And if you take a look at Twitter, that's also fairly obvious. Every single day, it seems, there's another argument between Kyle Kushov and David Hogg or some of these other students that were unfortunately involved in this tragedy. Despite the fact that five months have passed, the wounds have in no way closed. And listen, before I continue, I want to say that I cannot understand the suffering of the students and the faculty and the community of the people not just at Marjorie Stoneman and Douglas High School, but all of Broward County and Florida as a state. I can't understand it any more now than I could have five months ago. But despite the fact that I can't understand the emotions behind that, of course I can't. I can sympathize, but I can never empathize. One thing I think it is important for us to do, regardless, is to engage in continual analysis of this ongoing media event in order to understand it, the role that it plays in our society, and ultimately, potentially, the public policy that results as an outcome of it. It seems that the media on both sides is quick or was quick at least, to select a teenage champion for their cause, with little concern for the actual experiences of the average citizen of Broward County, be it, again, Kyle Kushov or David Hogg. We chose these kids on either side of the aisle and propped them up as figureheads. To me, that's absurd. But I wanted to understand better what it was like to actually be someone who was there, not a figurehead, not someone who's being pushed in front of the media, to be an average citizen of Broward County. Thus, I recently spoke with a student from a neighboring high school who had a friend that was seriously injured during the shooting. And I think we should listen to a bit of his account today, at least before we get into this. After all, it is so easy for us to divorce ourselves from the gravitas of an event, particularly when trying, as I usually am, to assess media or social context from a relatively unbiased or at least unbiased stance as possible, given we all do have our biases. We should still keep in mind just how deeply this event has affected the lives of thousands of people in these communities. And for that reason, not only do I think that it helps to hear a first-hand account like this, one we've certainly never heard before, and definitely not in the mainstream media, but also because it provides context for why this tragedy has remained so salient in the public zeitgeist. The funny thing is about the whole scenario that happened, when it all happened, it was kind of sudden to us. I was in class at the time, and the, the school was near, you know, pretty close to me, so I figured, hey, you know, we heard about it, we thought it was pretty fucking crazy. And then we got home later on, after all, you know, all the talk, and my brother and I looked at TV, thinking, oh, you know, might as well see what's going on. We were kind of confused. We saw someone who looked at my brother's friend. We're like, hey, you know, <laughs> that looks like a buddy. And we got a call from my mom, who's, you know, was watching it too. She goes, hey, uh, that is him. And that was, that was the weirdest, not, not even the weirdest, just kind of a terrifying experience with her to really think that just, <laughs> you, you'd really hope something like that didn't happen. I mean, that night we, we got him ice cream, poor kid. God's a trooper, I gotta tell ya. But, um, yeah, no, and then, I mean, through all the, through all the events that happened, the walkouts, and we, we were part of that. I mean, 
wasn't well, exactly pretty through the whole thing, but let me tell you, people ignore, I guess for the sake of hope or for the sake of propaganda, I really cannot tell which, but people ignored a lot of shit that happened that day, like, uh, you know, looting at a Walgreens on, you know, from people who were going to walk and march out. They, they were, like, robbed and looted the four places on the way there. But not all of them, you know, there's, the good thing is, it wasn't everyone doing it, it was just a small faction of people. And another faction just did it to get on news. Like, come on. It's, it's bullshit. People either want to be on the news, or, you know, want to be on TV, or they want to, you know, do their own shit. There's only a few people who really went, you know, for the cause, because they actually, you know, had someone there. Like me. I, I honestly personally didn't walk. I, I knew I couldn't make it that long. I'm sorry. Like 11 miles? You know, 14 miles? No, sorry. I don't know how long it is, but honestly, I, don't, I, I couldn't do it. I'm not in shape for that. However, that does lead to the whole thing of uh, when the people did get there. Kind of touching just to watch people, you know, old friends of mine running over to the, <laughs> to the school that I'd never been to. And my brother almost ended up at so, yeah, kind of terrifying. There is a social pull towards a sense of camaraderie and connectedness that so often arises in the wake of a tragedy. And although my friend here did not himself participate in his own school's walkout, his description of the event similarly reflects the community-oriented nature of these protests. This was about a sense of community, of social identity. Although we can say, and I certainly will say, that these movements have been largely co-opted and controlled by massive corporations, powerful and rich individuals, politicians, and policymakers, it is paramount we not forget the place of emotional turmoil and loss from which these movements arose. And sadly, I believe, have been taken advantage of in order to change politics without a concern for the very people upon whom these campaigns are based and built taking advantage of their suffering rather than attempting to ameliorate it. Well, Aiden, if all of this is just a natural reaction to outrage, to a tragedy, then why should any of us care? I mean, after all, as you said, they're just acting as that we would expect them to act. They are suffering. As I recently brought up, though, not all tragedies are treated equal here, folks. For example, we have other shootings like that at the YouTube headquarters recently, or even more recently at the Capitol Gazette. These events have quickly fallen by the wayside of public concern and, more importantly, media concern. While, as I mentioned above, the outrage and consternation regarding the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas has remained of considerable and consistent public interest and has been a major topic of discourse across the entire country, but particularly so has it been in Florida. And with no sign of stopping or slowing down anytime soon, as I've shown above, I mentioned a brief timeline of some of the events that have occurred from the proponents of greater gun control legislation in reaction to this event. Events that have been covered en masse by the media. So we know this is in no way over. And outside of the massive mainstream media coverage of things like March for Our Lives, countless articles have been written mostly in support of the various forms of protests that have been engaged in, such as the Publix Die-In, an event that, as I mentioned, likely cost that company, or at least the branches in which the demonstrations occurred, which, by the way, the man that you heard earlier here, previously worked at. A pretty penny, though. I would just say a pretty penny. I'm sure it cost them in profits at least for the couple of days that those were going on for. But has there been any major change in actual policy from all of these protests? Or is there any reason to fear that there may be a policy change over time? In short, did all of these demonstrations, did all of this outrage have any effect? Despite how much attention it received in the media, did it actually have any impact on legislation? While I've spoken generally about this topic before, and I've mentioned a couple of theories and concepts that I will cover in this video again quickly before I answer that general question with the hindsight and knowledge of time we now have at our disposal, let's just clarify a couple of things first. First of all, I still and never will in any way blame the students, faculty, citizens of the local community, or anybody involved. I've mentioned that before. But I want to make it clear once again, as I have in the past, that teenagers have a mental state that is disparate from that of adults. Teenagers are prone towards something called adolescent egocentrism, which is the tendency to make them more likely to perceive themselves as more or less, well, the center of the universe. This is, as with many things, a sort of no-duh factor of social science. We all know that teenagers are kind of egotistical. This is just the more technical term for it. Adolescent egocentrism. This manifests in a variety of ways. 
such as the perception of an imaginary audience, perceived invulnerability, and decreased empathetic processing. As we've covered before, the imaginary audience is the perception that everyone is paying attention to me and only me. I am the star of the show, which can manifest in both positive and negative valencies, in that people who want to be the center of attention view themselves again as the star of the show, while others may feel highly uncomfortable, as if they are constantly being judged, or any combination therein, really. Perceived invulnerability makes teens more likely to take risks, believing themselves to be invulnerable or invincible. Hence why so many teens end up in deadly car accidents, overdoses, and, well, just doing flat-out stupid shit. If Trinity was drinking and driving, I mean, that would be a big deal. But she wasn't. She had my open liquor in the car, going to the store to get her dad a bag of chips, which, what the fuck is the big problem with that? She shouldn't be taken downtown for that shit. My big concern is there's 12 pounds of hash in the trunk and a bunch of her money, and I have no idea how we're gonna get that the fuck out of the impound, but I guess we'll figure it out. But I'm a good dad. I'm a fucking great dad. I'm gonna teach you some stuff. I think her getting taken away by the cops is good for her. She'll learn from that. She'll probably be a better kid because of it. Worked for me. I turned out great. But it can also present in less extreme forms, such as with teens feeling as though not only are they the center of the stage, but that their cause is, or in this instance, infallible, and that their quest is, well, unquestionable. Finally, we find that empathy tends to slightly decrease in adolescence compared to younger children and adults in comparison. A potential outcome of this is a lack of perspective taking and being capable of understanding the complexities of certain situations due to that seeming inability to place the self in the shoes of others. This means that teenagers may be just slightly less capable of actually understanding the positions of others than those slightly older or, interestingly, slightly younger. This does not mean in any way that teens are some kind of weird, non-emotive subhumans. It just means that we're all sort of prone to make these errors, both logical and emotional, as teenagers, as our hormones are raging, because our brains are in turmoil through the inundation of the massive changes to our chemical structure. We all go through this, and it's why, again, I in no way blame the students that the media has propped up as icons of a political movement on either side. Of course not. Given I do not believe they have the exact same mental stability and judgment as adults would to be able to fully understand the depth and breadth of the ultimate outcomes of their actions and their involvement in these movements on either side of the aisle. Now, really quickly, despite the fact that I have at length made clear I in no way blame any of the students who have become involved in these demonstrations, given all of the adolescent psychological effects I just went over very quickly above, and I have done whole videos on those, this is just a recap. And despite the fact that I have endeavored to try and understand, on a personological level, the struggles and suffering of the local population, as I believe I have also expressed here, I must still, at the very real and present risk of my channel, point out some issues that I have with one student in particular, that being David Hogg. Look, as I have described, I think these kids are being used by both sides of the political spectrum. Kyle Kushov, who I have mentioned, has been pushed forward as a representative of right-wing politics, the Second Amendment, and even the NRA, just as much as Emma Gonzalez and David Hogg have been towards the opposition. These kids are, well, in my opinion, pretty much just kids, although yes, they are legally adults now. And I even apologize to my contact for saying as much to him. It's not like I'm trying to belittle you, but he more or less agreed with me that, yeah, most of his classmates probably had no idea how to cope with something of this level of seriousness, of this kind of extreme emotional impact. How unfair is it then for the media, for politicians, NGOs, and so on and so on to take these confused kids and turn them into pantocratic icons of a political movement while they contemplate the deaths the very real and visceral deaths of their friends, teachers, and neighbors. I'd say it's kind of fucked. But still, I have to say my piece. And again, if you guys aren't aware of this, there is sort of a moratorium on being able to say anything, even slightly critical of David Hogg. And ultimately, I must speak truth to power. And that is this. David Hogg is a typical adolescent who has been engulfed in the flames of those very effects of adolescent egocentrism, to a degree that I personally believe is harmful not only to him and his psyche, but to Floridians in general, and their public policy potentially. And really, ultimately, to US politics as a whole. All because that imaginary audience, that all teenagers experience on some level, was elevated to a very real, national, even international audience, on a 24-hour attention microscope from the legacy media. Again, I don't blame David personally. As far as I'm concerned, he's probably just a confused kid. 
but he has done several things that give me pause in the general kind of pass that I would give to any other young person put in his position for posterity's sake. And again, I'm telling you guys, I risk my entire channel for even mentioning any of the realities I'm about to say here. But I think we need mention them because, you know what? Democracy does die in the dark, I guess, Washington Post. I don't want to go over at length the initial interviews, which, yes, did seem rehearsed, and they did seem as if people were feeding him lines, because it's very likely that he was just incredibly shaken up by the event. But things have come out since then that raise more questions than they provide answers. For example, David, by his own admission, was not even at the school the day of the shooting. He says in this clip that he rode his bike to school once he heard about the shooting so that he could conduct interviews and cover the event as a journalist. On the day of the shooting, I got my camera and got on my bike and rode as fast as I could three miles from my house to the school. Now, I should make clear that Snopes and several other articles online have insisted that David was there during the actual shooting, but then he left and went home. And then this quote here is referring to a time later when he then returned to the school. Uh, all sounds a little bit fishy to me. That's all I'm going to say there. David had expressed significant interest in general in journalism work. There was also his suspicious coverage in the local news in California only a few months prior, wherein he received minor viral attention after being reprimanded by a lifeguard. And speaking of that, David had only lived in Broward County for a few months before the devastating shooting. And despite his invigorated passion towards the cause of preventing future catastrophes, despite how potentially misplaced the orientation in controlling the ownership of firearms, he didn't seem so enthusiastic about the community or about his high school that he has been ever since he has been overwhelmingly preoccupied in the months since the shooting as he was in the months before the event, as we can see here from some of his Reddit posts. In fact, he seemed outright disgusted with his fellow students and his school in general. For someone who is so incredibly invigorated by this event that he puts a price tag on his cap, it seems odd to me that this incredible motivation towards the community appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Again, I think David is just a teenager whose adolescent egocentrism and propensity for perception of an imaginary audience has been exacerbated almost ad infinitum by that media microscope that turned him into a celebrity overnight. And I'm sure he wants to maintain that celebrity status on some level. And thus, it's not really the people who were affected by this event that are to blame, including David Hogg, even if he wasn't there. No, it's predominantly the media that took the story and ran with it like the wind. And yes, coverage has slowed, but as we've seen, it has in no way halted, nor has the outrage, the outcry, the demonstrations, and the protests. The question then comes back to this. What is the outcome of all of this media exposure, this focus on the shooting in Parkland? The answer must lie in policy, right? Outrage is nothing without action. Obviously, policy changes are what have been the rallying cry of the students and the community, not just from Florida, but from across the nation. Students who walked out of class or who continue to this day to engage in these demonstrations thousands of miles across the nation. Considering the massive Road to Change tour is, again, in full swing currently, funded, surely, entirely by humanitarians and in no way by politicians and individuals seeking change to legislation, you would think the media deluge regarding this event must have had, of yet, little to no impact on gun laws, right? I mean, why else would they keep marching with such fervor? Except that's completely incorrect. Within a month, on March 9th, Republican Florida Governor Rick Scott signed in sweeping new gun legislation in the state, which earned him not only scorn from the NRA, but the NRA is now in fact suing the state over it. It also earned him just scorn from conservatives in general. The new law, which raised the minimum age to buy rifles from 18 to 21, extended the existing three-day waiting period for handgun purchases to include long guns, and banned bump stocks was a major change to Florida gun policy. This law was signed in two weeks before the March for Our Lives rally. Yet, was there really any mention of it or any indication that policy changes were being made at really a quite rapid pace in response to, well, something, be it the shooting itself or the demonstrations or the ubiquitous, completely unavoidable media coverage. Sure, some of you have probably heard about these legislation changes, perhaps in the same media that, rather than laud the very change being demanded, criticized this bill for not going far enough. 
Joining me tonight is Cameron Kasky, a Stoneman Douglas student and survivor who pushed for these new gun laws. Cameron, what's your reaction to the governor, to Governor Rick Scott, signing this legislation today? You know, Governor Scott is trying to look like he's taking a step in the opposite of the direction of the NRA, but we know that's not really going to happen. And while seeing these two parties move in the right direction together is a positive thing, it's a baby step. I mean, if you really look at the bill, it's we need to ban assault rifles. We need to ban assault rifles. Or, I mean, you just outright have outlets like this, which is associated with the March for Our Lives, that directly lies that Rick Scott has done anything to forward gun legislation. These are the kind of lies that we're dealing with. Fabrication and obfuscation of the truth. This bill was signed in three weeks after the shooting, and neither side was pleased with it. But the only side that appears to be doing anything about it is the right. Remember, again, this bill is what the NRA is suing the state of Florida over for a violation of the Second and Fourteenth Amendments. Yet, have the demonstrations slowed? Did anyone say thank you, Rick Scott, for actually doing something? Doing what we asked you to do? Fuck no. The demonstrations continue unmitigated. But hang on. There's a lot of local outrage, so despite the fact that no one on the national level appeared to pay much notice to these laws, that's just Florida, and we should maybe expect this kind of legislative response in the state where the tumultuous upheaval of so many lives of so many people occurred. Except, as the media train kept chugging, politicians across the country similarly felt their feet held to a fire and began to enact similar changes to the legal system regarding firearms. On June 11th, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy signed in six new pieces of gun control legislation into the books, which reduce firearm magazine capacity from 15 rounds to 10, require firearm seizure from individuals posing a threat to themselves or others, what's called a red flag law, we'll get into that, outlawed armor-piercing ammunition, authorized restraining orders and firearm seizure warrants if a mental health provider warns law enforcement, required new background checks for private gun sales, and tightened the definition of, quote, justifiable need to obtain a handgun carry permit. This is, again, the state of New Jersey. While the media continued to coo over the die-ins at the Publix, which happened barely two weeks before these were signed into law, as brave, where was the coverage of this monumental change to New Jersey's gun laws? New Jersey, which was already one of the strictest and most stringent states in the country when it came to gun control. In the last five months, the states of Rhode Island, Vermont, Connecticut, and Washington have all passed new laws to ban bump stocks, as did the city of Lincoln, Nebraska. Even Trump made a public statement about potentially signing an executive order for a federal ban on bump stocks, which thankfully has not yet come to fruition. And really quickly, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills that I have to continually explain this. Let's go over what a bump stock is. How does it, um, how does it work? I know not, my liege. Consult the Book of Armaments. Armaments, chapter 2, verses 9 to 21. A bump stock does not miraculously transform a semi-automatic firearm into a fully automatic firearm. Semi-automatic means one pull of the trigger, one shot. Nothing about a bump stock changes this. Instead, it's about the bumping movement. It allows the momentum from the kickback of the firearm to essentially assist in a more rapid pull of the trigger. That's all it does. It does not make it an automatic weapon. But I digress. That's not the point. The point here is in describing the changes to policy, and I am nowhere near done yet, even with that. In New York, Cuck Cuomo's brother and state governor Andrew Cuomo passed a law in March requiring all people convicted of domestic abuse to surrender any and all firearms to the state. Similarly, in March, Oregon Governor Kate Brown signed in legislation to prevent convicted stalkers or domestic abusers from purchasing firearms. In April, Vermont Governor and Republican Phil Scott enacted significant new gun legislation, which in addition to the bump stock ban also limits the size of magazines and expanded the extent of background checks on buyers and finally raised the purchasing age from 18 to 21 within the state. 
In the months since the shooting, Florida, Vermont, Maryland, Rhode Island, and New Jersey all signed in these so-called red flag laws that allow family and friends to report someone as a risk to themselves or others and have their firearms confiscated from them by law enforcement. As of early July, Massachusetts joined their ranks with the red flag law. Finally, and perhaps most egregiously, Deerfield, Illinois lawmakers proposed a policy designed to confiscate, quote, assault-style weapons, read, all semi-automatic firearms, by charging a thousand dollars per day fine towards citizens who refused to turn in their property to the Gestapo, I mean the city. Thankfully, the law was blocked by a circuit court judge in mid-June. The protesters and rabble-rousers are getting what they wanted. And while I'm sure many of you have continued to hear about these protests, how many of you were aware of these massive changes to public policy? I'm asking because, honestly, I wasn't aware of the extent of the changes that have been put into effect over the last five months. I knew of some of them, but I had no idea just how many changes had been made, and how many are still being made. Texas is also potentially debating having a new red flag law go into effect as well. Could this be, then, in opposition to everything I have said about the media effects being small in their scope and ability to impact people long term? Is that at odds? It seems that the media has had quite a big effect here. Well, maybe. After all, the media has maintained its focus in an extremely myopic direction and attention, albeit to a lesser extent over time, on this anti-gun narrative and on the demonstrations we have discussed at the top. But to a significantly lesser degree have they covered the results, despite being very much in line with the demands being made by the protesters. Thus, let's discuss once again media effects and potentially isolate a particular media effect that we have not discussed before today that may play a role in the implementation of changes to public policy. In the past, I have spoken about agenda setting and cultivation theories, but for those who are new, let's have a quick recap. Agenda setting, the seminal being McCombs and Shaw 1972, which in and of itself as a study identified an astounding 0.97 correlation between news media outlets reporting and what news stories people thought were important. And then there's cultivation theory, the seminal being Gerbner 1969, which suggests that the media depiction of events potentially obscures our perception of reality, at least for chronic consumers. Agenda setting theory proposes that media does not influence our opinions about a topic or subject, but rather that it sets the agenda of what topics we think about. In contrast, cultivation theory posits that excessive exposure, particularly to news media, and particularly violent news media, may affect our perception of our susceptibility to crime or any other type of event depicted in high frequency through what's called the mean world phenomena. This phenomena predicts that massive media consumers view the world as more violent and crime as more prevalent than it is in reality based on statistical data. Thus, what is it that we're looking at here with these changes in policy? Is it just an expression of one of these two theories we've covered before? Is the media focus on the Parkland shooting forward in these outcomes as a result of setting the agenda and cultivating fear of gun violence? Potentially. So let's dig into some of the relevant studies. Well, at first glance, I suspect the device creates a stable wormhole between superconducting rings that have been placed in fixed positions elsewhere Converts in the matter into energy at the event horizon. Once the initial vortex has subsided, of course. And just because my sex organs are on the inside instead of the outside doesn't mean that I can't handle Provided, it. Provided, of course, that sufficient energy has been channeled to the device and that the correct coordinates have been calculated. Okay, get to it. Lowry, Neal, and Leitner, 2003, conducted a longitudinal analysis to further understand how media sets the agenda and potentially cultivates a mean world perception of reality. Of interest to us today, this study assessed the topic that the survey sample felt was of most importance to their daily lives, or MIP. The analysis found a frankly astonishing leap in perceptions of crime as the United States MIP problem between the years of 1992 and 1994. In 1992, only 5% of respondents listed crime as the most important issue facing the nation, but by 1994, 52% of respondents named violent crime as America's number one issue, a massive increase that the researchers referred to here as the big scare. Lowry and his colleagues found, in partial support of cultivation theory, that the actual crime rate in the United States was unrelated to the spike in perceptions of the country's MIP meaning that people became increasingly concerned with crime despite a dropping national crime rate which has continued to drop in the years since the study was conducted. Interestingly, 
the mere number of stories reporting on acts of crime had no effect on MIP perceptions. But the length of stories and coverage of the stories did. In other words, the more time that the media spent on a topic, in this instance crime, the more likely people were to view that topic as the most pressing issue facing the country. Still, TV exposure in general was far more significant of a predictor of belief of the importance of crime as a major problem in the United States than actual FBI statistics, regardless. With TV exposure accounting for 34% of variance in MIP perception, and FBI statistics, in contrast, accounting for only 9% of variance. I bring up this study, which only assessed national news coverage rather than national and local, to illustrate how important television and media use is to forming our perceptions of what issues are of the greatest interest to our communities and to ourselves potentially. And when issues are pressing to our communities, of course, it's uh, unquestionable that we inevitably reach out to our local policymakers and legislators to attempt to make changes to mitigate these perceived problems. It seems, though, that fear and vulnerability, as we've seen here, may play a role in the perceptions of what problems are of most importance to us. To better answer that, let's look to Jameson and Romer 2014, who assessed specifically television dramas and perception of crime rates between 1972 and 2010. And yeah, lads, I'm gonna be throwing out the big longitudinal studies at you today, friends, because uh, we haven't even hit today's new theory yet. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a long one. Anyway, the researchers developed a structural equation model which included both actual violent crime statistics and frequencies of depictions of violent crime in fictional television shows, both directly and indirectly in their model, with fear of crime and local commonality as mediator variables. Frequency of violence on television was directly related to fear of crime, regardless of perceptions of local vulnerability. In other words, if you see crime on TV, it doesn't matter how likely crime is in your neighborhood. It makes you a little bit more afraid. National crime rates were related to perceptions of local crime rates in that people believed national averages to represent their local communities, but so did frequency of violence on television. Additionally, while national crime rates predicted greater fear in general, it did so only when participants also felt that they were locally susceptible to crime. Although local susceptibility clearly has a major role to play here, it is obvious at this point that fear does play a role. But before we move on to the last topic, one more thing I want to cover. I want to broach the potential differences between those local and national news coverages. After all, at a national level, we've heard tons about these demonstrations, but it's only at the local level that we tend to hear about the actual changes to legislation, or so it seems. Gross in a Day 2003 wanted to examine local and national crime rates in comparison to exposure to various types of news media and, well, personal exposure to victimization of criminality, as well as perceptions of susceptibility to crime and fear of victimhood. The results forwarded evidence for agenda-setting function of the media with a positive correlation between viewership of local news and perceptions of crime as being either the most important problem with a correlation of 0.55 or one of the most important problems with a correlation of 0.57 facing their lives, indicating again that what topics we hear about in the news media are the topics we are concerned with, at least what preoccupy our mind space, if you want to call it that. Maybe for this video we should only refer to it as headspace. <laughs> but interestingly, there was no similar correlation between the topics of national news and those of most important concern. This seemingly contradicts or conflicts with the research of Lowry, Neo, and Leitner in that it seemed only local news affected perceptions of the MIP, while Lowry's research only assessed national news coverage and found the same effects. Additionally, while now potentially dated given the age of the study at the time, internet use was negatively correlated to a rather strong degree at the level of 0.43 with perception of crime as the MIP. Finally, the greatest predictor of cultivation and the concept of a mean world kind of effect was personal experience and exposure to crime, and to a slightly lesser extent, victimization of family, friends, and neighbors, rather than media exposure to violence. Unsurprisingly. But in other words, you could say yes, the media has an effect, but nothing trumps personal experiences. 
So let's further delve into that concept of fear then as it interacts with news media coverage as a last little bit here. Gonzales, Small, and Fischoff, 2003, examined the impact of a major news story, in this instance the 9-11 attacks, in conjunction with feelings of fear and anger in a longitudinal, told you we were going for the big guns today only boys, two-time assessment of public perception between September 25th and November 10th of 2001. To examine the lingering or potentially even growing acerbic effects upon public opinion related to exposure to news regarding said catastrophe. Across the 1,786 participants, hey, that's close to 1,776, which will occur again, those who reported experiencing anger in response to the 9-11 attacks were less likely to perceive future risks for U.S. citizens to be the victims of terrorism. Interesting. In contrast, those who experienced fear perceived greater risk for the self and a significantly higher risk for the average American when it came to terrorist action. Fear became a slightly greater indicator of probability of risk for the average American in males than it was in females in this study. Perceived risk of future danger was, interestingly, negatively related to desire for vengeance against the 9-11 attackers or those responsible, but was instead positively related to greater cautionary action for both the self and for others. That is, those who said that they felt afraid rather than angry did not want to take any active steps against terrorists, but rather preferred a defensive stance of self-protection. Further, anger was associated with a greater desire for honest media reporting, while in contrast, and I, I must point out that this was to a non-significant degree, so uh, these data are not robust, if you want to say that, and I need to put about a hundred asterisks beside them for that point as I report this but it was correlated non-significantly over the same assessed period of time. Non-significant correlation though. That is, people who are angry want greater media accountability. People who are afraid do not necessarily want the same. They don't want the media to tell them the harsh truth, or at least there's no strong evidence that they do. Maybe they want the sweet lies. Similarly, though, fear was related to greater desire for government intervention and action, particularly in the area of public safety and health. In the short term, those who desired vengeance and expressed anger had a greater desire to deport foreigners, which was maintained over time over this assessment. But in contrast, those who felt fearful and anxious moved from general ambivalence towards deportation in a negative direction against deporting illegal immigrants. Similarly, while the strength of the correlation decreased slightly over time, those who desired vengeance or who felt anger in response to the 9-11 attacks expressed decreased desire to interact with the Muslim world, while no such finding was present in those who felt fearful. While this is just one study, a fascinating naturalistic one at that, it is just one example that may indicate the kind of emotions incurred in the public having a significant effect on how the public responds to the same news story with either anger or fear, potentially resulting in different outcomes. With anger seemingly being related to greater desire for action and fear potentially being related to more capitulation and management of that fear. So given we've covered all of these topics before and given that it is undeniable that the media does affect public perceptions on some level, if not how we think entirely, at least what we think about, is it possible that the media is responsible on some level for the influx of so many gun laws that we've seen in the past, somewhat silently being passed into legislation over the previous five months? And I'm sorry that I'm going to kind of pull a little bit of a switcheroo here, guys, because I'm going to ask you to have to wait for the answer for that question. So I'm sorry for blueballing you guys a little bit here because I'm not going to exactly answer the question of what is this potentially new theory we're talking about, that being the CNN effect. Frankly, because I looked down at my script here and realized I had 3,000 words to go and I am, as of me looking at my recording, 40 some minutes into <laughs> just bullshitting right now. But really, this was not bullshit. We needed to cover what has happened in the months since the Parkland shooting, because it's been fairly monumentous. So very quickly, let's go over what we learned today. We learned that, well, frankly, the demonstrations and the protests since the Valentine's Day shooting in Parkland, Florida, has in no way ceased. They have continued and are continuing to go with vigor and strength. We also learned that despite an equal amount of mainstream media attention, there has been significant policy changes put onto the books over the last five months. We don't hear much about it, but it's certainly happening, and it is continuing to happen. 
we've talked about some of the general effects of adolescent egocentrism that may be involved in all of this. We've gotten some first-hand accounts from Broward County citizens. And I think most interestingly to most of you, my dear viewers, although I think all of it's interesting, we got to hear a little bit more research about why it might be that the media is able to set the agenda and determine for the American citizens what are the issues that are of most importance to their daily lives. Over the last five months, we have seen consistently that the Parkland shooting has been one of the issues of most importance to Americans' daily lives. Gun control and gun legislation has been on the docket consistently. The only reason it's kind of moved off a little bit is because the media wanted to focus on the separation of parents from children at the border, which that's a whole nother issue we've talked about, but uh, not today. Before we get into the second half of this video, which we'll be actually discussing in depth and detail the history and psychology and evidence behind what's called the CNN effect, I want to pose a question to you, my dear friends. Do you think that the media really has the ability, that CNN has the capacity to not just change public perceptions, but to change public policy? Is it possible that the media can put pressure upon policymakers and essentially force them within a very short span of time to make decisions they otherwise might not make? Please be sure to provide your answer in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe. I will be back with you very shortly with the second half of this series on the CNN effect. I hope you've enjoyed this first part though. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altana Volt. Hitler took the guns, Stalin took the guns, Mao took the guns, Fidel Castro took the guns. 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. We will not relinquish them, do you understand? The Republic will rise again. Don't try what your ancestors did before. Why don't you come to America? I'll take you out shooting. You can become an American and join the Republic. And I want to say this right here. You think you're a tough guy? Well, have me back with a boxing ring in here, and I'll wear red, white, and blue, and you can wear your Jolly Roger. Okay. You know what? You Let's try again. <laughs>